and then we'll start the program. All right, well, welcome everybody uh, to our talk tonight. Um, my name is Alex Palma and I'm the assistant director at uh, the Carpenters Company, which is located at Carpenters Hall in Philadelphia. Uh, tonight, we have a program um, with the architectural historian Izzy Kornblatt on Louis Kahn and the Frank Furness connection. Um, I'm so thankful that you all are here. Um, we do uh, ask that you remain on mute throughout the presentation, uh, just for everybody's convenience. Um, however, we will be collecting questions in the chat box. So if you want uh, a question to be addressed, uh, just drop it in the chat and we'll bring it up later. Um, I'm uh, so thankful that we were able to partner with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, as represented by Justina Barrett here, uh, as well as um, Premier Building Restoration. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to uh, let um, each of our partners say a word or two um, about themselves. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it off uh, to Justina. Uh, go ahead when you're ready. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Welcome to everybody out there. My name is Justina Barrett, and I'm the Director of Education and Programs at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I'm delighted to support tonight's program. Uh, HSP, if you're not familiar with us, was founded in 1824, and we proudly serve as Philadelphia's Library of American History. Our collection contains over 21 million manuscripts, books, and graphic items that hold the stories of all Americans including maps, watercolors, uh, photographs, and other graphic items that depict the built environment. I'm particularly excited to hear Izzy talk about uh, Louis Kahn and Frank Furness. Uh, Izzy was an author in a recent edition of HSP's publication, the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography. Um, and just as an example, our collections at HSP come alive when you use them in your classrooms, in your research, and in your publications. Do join us if you can at 13th and Locust in our reading room or online at hsp.org. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Justina. Um, we're so thrilled to have the uh, chance to partner with HSP on this program and programs in the future too. Um, so I'll welcome now uh, Emily from Premier to say a few words also. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Emily Schricker and I'm with Premier Building Restoration. We are very proud to be sponsoring this event and the Carpenters Company and all of the amazing work that they do. Um, Premier Building Restoration is a full service historic masonry and waterproofing company. Uh, we have over 25 years <clears throat> of experience working with a variety of materials, uh, stone, brick, terracotta, concrete are just some of the few. Our experienced masons are trained in the historic restoration of materials such as brownstone, limestone, and historic mortar matching. Uh, some of the recent projects you may have seen around town that Premier has been working on uh, is the Athenaeum, which recently won an award from the Preservation Alliance for this year uh, with the great team that was working on that. Uh, we did a lot of work on the Reading Terminal Market and the Pennsylvania Convention Center for a lot of the work that they've been doing over the past few years, and uh, also some work down at Elfris Alley down in Old City. So we are uh, excited to be here and happy to be part of it. And, and I personally am really looking forward to this uh, presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. I uh, appreciate uh, Premier support. Um, and uh, you guys have been wonderful partners over the last few years, so I appreciate it. Um, speaking of building restoration, uh, you all probably know that Carpenters Hall sustained a fire um, late last year. Um, so if you all are feeling generous tonight, we'll be dropping a, a donation link to our restoration fund in the description or in the chat rather. Um, and if you like events like this one, um, you know, follow us on social media, uh, go on our website. Um, we have events like this all the time. 
Um, the next big one we have coming up is actually uh, our David McCullough Prize for uh, public history that we give about every year. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that one will be on April 28th. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll be 26, dropping a link. 26, 26, 26, there we go. Um, 26, April 26. Um, and so with that, I will introduce Izzy. Um, so Izzy, Izzy Kornblatt is an architectural critic and historian pursuing a PhD in history and theory of architecture at Yale. Uh, he serves as a contributing editor at Architectural Records. Um, originally from Massachusetts, he studied philosophy at Swarthmore College and design studies at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he received the 2019 thesis prize for his study, Architecture for a New World, Louis Kahn and Philadelphia. He has contributed to several books uh, and is published in a variety of publications. Um, for example, like uh, the one that Justina mentioned, the HSP, and uh, has curated two exhibitions among other projects. So without further ado, Izzy Kornblatt. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, is, is it visible now, the presentation? All right. Um, thank you again, Alex. Uh, it's really an honor to be invited here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present some of my research on Khan. To start out, I just want to thank um, Michael and Alyssa and Alex from the Carpenters Company, as well as Justina from the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, um, Premier Building Restoration, and everyone who possible, and all of you for um, coming out. Or signing on Zoom. I also want to apologize in advance to anyone who is sitting through this talk for the second time, as I've now presented this work on a few occasions. But in light of some more recent thinking, I've expanded and updated for today, which I hope makes things a little less repetitive. Now, just to give some background, this research was conducted between 2017 and 2019 as part of my master's thesis on Khan and Philadelphia at Harvard, and it was subsequently published, as Justina mentioned, in the excellent Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography in 2021. I've included a citation for the published essay at the end of the presentation for anyone who's interested. Now, in many ways, my work began with this image, the image of Khan to which we're all now accustomed. In fact, this serves as the frontispiece for You Say to Brick, Wendy Lesser's popular biography of Khan. Here we have the individual genius staring up at his creation, in this case, the ceiling of the Yale Art Gallery. It's as if Kahn's own gaze were supporting it, for no vertical structure of any kind is evident. It's just architect and object, building as testament to the enigmatic genius of its creator. But for the historian, an enigma is an opportunity, and the first to seize it wins definitive authority over the subject. In the case of Kahn, the historian was Yale professor Vincent Scully, who had the benefit of knowing Kahn from the late 1940s to his death in the early 1970s. Following Kahn's death, and the timeline is important, began to make the case Kahn was historically significant for his return to antiquity, his recreation of ancient monuments in the modern world. For Scully, the building itself, and specifically the pyramidal voids in the ceiling of the Yale Art Gallery, becomes the built evidence for a very specific interpretation of all of Kahn's subsequent work. For the idea that the roots of Kahn's career can be found in his fellowship at the American Academy in Rome and his travels around the Mediterranean in the early 1950s. It was during that trip, Scully writes, in one of several articles dedicated to making this point, when the first great architects of Western civilization reached out to him and set him on his way and the pyramidal voids at the art gallery, the first building Khan designed following his return from this grand tour, demonstrate the internalization of the pyramids of Giza and mark the beginning of a long sequence of transplantings of ancient ruins into modern buildings. This return to antiquity idea purported to explain the meaning of Khan's work, but it did so based on flimsy archival evidence, a couple of trips to Europe, travel sketches completed along the way, 
a few letters gushing about the joys of Italian architecture. It is not a view that is substantiated in writings or interviews or even unpublished documents. And in fact, when confronted with this interpretation during his lifetime, Kahn avidly disavowed it. Nonetheless, Scully's narrative took hold with the addition of a second line of influence, that of Kahn's Beaux-Arts education at the University of Pennsylvania. Starting in earnest in the early 1980s and following the lead of the historian Kenneth Frampton, a number of scholars began looking for what Frampton called French connections in Kahn's work. That is, links between Kahn and French neoclassicism running back through the 18th century. There's much to be said about the Beaux-Arts system of education at Penn, of course, but the point here is that in the interpretation of a number of these scholars, its importance lay in its recourse to history, its triumphant rejection of a supposedly ahistorical modernism in favor of an architecture overtly referencing European models. And it is true that Beaux-Arts architectural culture in the United States did often regard imitation as the sincerest form of flattery, as seen here. If in some ways experimentation was encouraged and novel ideas embraced, in the realm of aesthetics, history ruled with an iron fist. It's also important to note that these interpretations of Kahn are intimately related to the attitude and culture of architectural history and practice at the time when they were developed. Influenced by the rise of revivalism in architecture and the historical interests that accompanied it, for example, MoMA held an exhibition entitled The Architecture of the École des Beaux-Arts in 1975, Historians like Frampton and Scully found in Kahn a bridge from the architecture of the 1950s and 1960s to that of the 1980s. For Scully and his followers, Kahn, like Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier before him, proved that Western antiquity formed the basis for even the most abstract 20th century architecture. For Frampton, by contrast, Kahn's work represented a continuation of the rationalism of his teacher, Paul Cray, and a realization of the stark visions of Ledoux and Boulay. My own research on Khan dive into this existing body of Khan historiography with an effort to understand the ideas and narratives that trace their way across some 50 years of Khan scholarship to form the largely unquestioned portrait often reproduced today. This is actually a slide I put together when conducting that research in 2018. It's designed to show an overall timeline of key publications on Khan, which are color coded very roughly in terms of narrative ideas. So here, pink are early texts written by those who knew Khan personally, and by and large, avoid advancing larger ideological narratives about his work. Yellow is the Roman ruins narrative spearheaded by Scully in his second phase, that is after Khan died. Blue is the French connection narrative, which actually has its roots before Frampton in the Italian scholarship of the 1960s. And we can see here that these narratives are synthesized and crystallized in an important pair of exhibitions, one in 1991, one in 2012. I should note again that this is an extremely loose diagram and we could debate where several of these authors really belong, but I've included it here just as a general illustration and to explain my process of looking at historiography in an effort to examine or expand or destabilize an existing narrative. As an aside, there is a scholar missing here who I think deserves mentioning, Sarah Williams Goldhagen, whose book, Louis Kahn Situated Modernism, does not fit neatly into these existing tropes, which is why I excluded it. But for anyone looking to read a book on Kahn, that is the one that I would recommend without hesitation. But back to my research, in which I sought to tear apart these received narratives. I started with an obvious observation that Kahn lived almost his entire life, around 70 years, in the industrial city of Philadelphia. Architectural historians, have tended to focus excessively on how certain architects influence other architects, but buildings are not designed in a vacuum. They are built by clients in particular places and embody particular meanings. And in regions and cities around the world, cultures of building characterized by material, construction and design methods, climate, religion, et cetera, tend to develop separately. Now, the regionalist project of placing Khan within Philadelphia architectural culture is a very broad one. But today I want to focus on just one aspect, the relationship of Kahn to Frank Furness, Philadelphia's great architect of the 19th century. For the first half of the 20th century, the first 50 years of Kahn's life, Frank Furness was not a name architects liked to utter. 
young modernists rebelling against the Beaux-Arts classicism of the 1930s, saw the work of Furness and his Victorian era contemporaries as gauche and decadent, decisively non-modern and in tragic contradiction of Adolf Loos's subsequent admonition against the use of ornament. Proponents of the Beaux-Arts and other historicists liked Furness no better. To them, he was too modern, too individualistic. He may be beloved in Philadelphia now, but there was a reason so many of his works were torn down in the decades after his death. On the surface, Furness and Kahn's respective works are quite different, but a close look at how the two architects handled the expression of structure and building services reveals some interesting visual similarities. At his since demolished American Federation of Labor Medical Center in Center City, Kahn exposed Varendil trusses in the walls of the central stairway, recalling the exposed iron columns and beams embedded in the wall of the stair at Furnace's Baltimore and Ohio rail terminal. Kahn, who often traveled by train, would have certainly been familiar with Furnace's building, and it's hard to imagine that he didn't make the connection between these similar details. Or take the Furnace Library. Kahn attended Penn, where he studied in the reading room before it was chopped in half in the 1920s. In the 1950s, when he came back to teach at Penn, he actually taught in this building, as seen in the picture that began my slideshow. And when Kahn designed his Richards Medical Labs at Penn, he seems to have looked directly at the great stair tower at the front of Furnace's library. In both buildings, a careful effort is made to separate circulation and mechanical systems into vertical volumes visually pulled away from the main building mast. And both architects stick these big vertical volumes right onto the front of the building, so you can't miss them. A dive into Kahn's archives reveals ideas that are even closer to Furnace. Here we see Kahn studying options for the Richards Towers in which they grow outward as they rise to reflect the increase in airflow from each successive floor. Such a move would not really be justified engineering-wise, but it reflects the influence of the ventilation stacks of the 19th century, which have such, had such large tops in part due to the idea that a heavier top would draw heat upward, creating upward draft. So what does our Kahn authority have to say about these similarities? In 1961, while Kahn was still alive, Scully admitted noticing the Richards Furnace Library connection, but insisted there was nothing further to be found on the subject. Kahn has said, I believe correctly, that he was never personally drawn to that architect's buildings. Because of Scully's evident authority, scholars since 1961 have largely dismissed any Kahn Furnace connection. When I started my own research, I heard the same view repeatedly. But a little further digging yielded an alternative opinion. Kahn's professional associates, Henry Wilcox and Ray Han Larimer, and his former Penn colleague, Denise Scott Brown, all told me of the high regard in which Kahn held Furnace. Kahn's favored student and former associate, William Huff, recalled in a 1981 essay that Kahn greatly admired Furnace. And the editors of Kahn's complete works, describing the series of conversations they conducted with him about his career, reported that, quote, Kahn held the work of Furnace in great esteem continually underlining the role of this work in his own formation as an architect. But all that is general and anecdotal. To illustrate the full extent to which Kahn was influenced by Furness, I'll delve into three specific cases where Kahn engaged with Furness's work and show how Kahn's interest points not just to admiration of Furness, but even led to Kahn helping save several Furness buildings from demolition. And most importantly, to Kahn recognizing in Furness's methods a precedent for his own ideas, just as careful observation of the Richards Medical Lab's service tower suggests. Now, as proposed in the 1940s and 1950s, Independence Mall was to be a three block long axial promenade in front of Independence Hall. Its establishment would necessitate the destruction of dozens of 19th century commercial buildings, including several banks by Furness located on adjacent blocks of Chestnut Street, which are not visible in this photo. Initially conceived in the 1920s by a group of Beaux-Arts architects, including Paul Cray, who looked down on Furness's work, the mall was eventually carried out on a larger scale and with a self-consciously modern aesthetic under the aegis of a committee that included Cray's deputy, Roy Larson. But the links to the axial boulevards of Paris are unmistakable, even in the supposedly modern final product. When the mall was planned, 
few architects appreciated furnace, but two who did and who were active as the debate over the ball raged were George Howe and Frank Lloyd Wright, both of whom played roles in Kahn's thinking. Howe, Kahn's friend, mentor, and for a brief period, partner in practice, had in fact worked in Furnace's office for a brief period immediately following Furnace's death in 1912. And as a result, he had a distinct appreciation for Furnace's work. That appreciation set Howe apart from the majority of his colleagues and led him in the 1950s to speak out against them all. In a 1955 speech, Howe stated plainly that, quote, the fine 19th century buildings on Chestnut and Walnut Streets should be preserved. The 19th century buildings were designed by some of the most dedicated and original architects our country has ever produced. They are the very symbol of our hard-won independence. Howe's reference to some of the most dedicated and original architects pointed directly to Furnace, as correspondence in the Avery archives at Columbia between Howe and National Park Service architect Charles Peterson confirms. Prior to giving his speech, Howe had requested Peterson's assistance in assessing the area's 19th century buildings. Four days before the speech, Peterson responded with a list of notable area buildings and their architects. He started by highlighting Furnace. But if the research owed to Peterson, the commentary was Howe's own. So with Kahn's mentor, Howe, expressing opposition to the mall plans, it was no surprise that Kahn did too. In fact, Kahn's longtime structural engineer and Carpenter's Company uh, member, Nick Giannopoulos, who worked with Kahn on multiple projects during the independence mall debate, distinctly remembered Kahn's opposition to the project. He told me that Kahn even said that I would rather see them tear down Independence Hall than that building, referring to one of Furnace's banks. And he made the bigger claim that Lou acknowledged Furnace as a predecessor for his own work. Thanks to Giannopoulos' experience as one of Kahn's collaborators and confidants, he had an intimate understanding of how Kahn conceived of architecture as the expression of, we might say, a building's essential purpose, understood as its social meaning and its material construction. And thanks to his interest in architectural history and later leadership in the restoration of furnace buildings, Giannopoulos understood furnace equally well. So it's very notable in my eyes that he saw clear parallels in the two architects' thinking. Carrying Giannopoulos' thought further, the particular banks demolished on Chestnut Street, we can see exactly why Furnace's work felt relevant to Kahn. At these banks, Kahn found a precedent for an architecture that married the expression of material and structure with the lofty social aspiration of reflecting contemporary life. Long before Kahn, Furnace had integrated structure and mechanical systems into a greater whole that conveyed what he understood to be the essence of an institution, what a thing wants to be, as Kahn would famously and obscurely describe his own way of designing buildings. But despite Janopoulos' view, two of the most expansive and authoritative volumes on Kahn's work tell us in no uncertain terms that Kahn did not object to the Independence Ball proposal. The source of this view seems to be an essay published in Louis I. Kahn in the Realm of Architecture in 1991, including this passage. Although as a youth, Kahn had also explored the old shops that then lined the north side of Chestnut Street, demolished to create the ball, he had not objected to their demise, for it gave Independence Hall a more glorious position. This anecdote is of a piece with the larger view of Kahn as a product of the Beaux-Arts. In context, the essay functions as additional evidence that Kahn was, at heart, a Beaux-Arts architect drawn to the neoclassicism of Independence Hall, but not the vulgarities of the subsequent Victorian era. So I decided to track down the speech that is cited here. Was Kahn really a Beaux-Arts architect praising a scheme launched by his pen professor? Or did he rather follow in the mold of Howe in opposing the demolition of Furnace's banks? This is what I found in Kahn's speech. Before the mall was built, it was a point of great controversy because this building, Independence Hall, huddled amongst the buildings of development around it and took on a scale which related to the street. Now it has been given a more glorious position as though the mall is a celebration of Independence Hall. Now it begins to take on its own rights, whereas previously everyone thought, including myself, that no building around it should be touched, but that it should fit amongst the other buildings 
as though it were an incident in the growth of the city. So in reality, Khan made really no effort to hide the fact that he had objected to the construction of Independence Mall, and for the same reasons as how. He believed Independence Hall ought to remain a living part of the city, related organically to its surroundings. On this point, no building around it should be touched, leaves no doubt. Khan's use of the term glorious position seems more descriptive than praising in context, though he does concede to having warmed up to Independence Mall over the years. This speech was actually given on the roof of Independence Hall in the early 1970s. And notably, Khan's comment that everyone held the same view of the project indicates the currency Howe's opinion had picked up among young Philadelphia architects in the 1950s. The takeaway here then is that by Khan's own admission, he opposed the construction of Independence Mall due to the demolition required of the surrounding buildings, two of which were key early works by Frank Furness. But it was not until the early 1960s at Khan's proposed campus expansion for the Philadelphia College of Art that he engaged directly with Furness. In so doing, Khan demonstrated both his sophisticated understanding of Furness's design methods and his own interest in adapting them for contemporary purposes. The Philadelphia College of Art, now the University of the Arts, moved to its present campus in 1893 when it acquired the buildings of what was originally called the Pennsylvania Institution for the Deaf and Dumb at Broad and Pine Streets. The complex consisted of several buildings, the stone and stucco Greek revival original designed by John Haviland, a few extensions in the same style, and two industrial brick wings at the very back designed in 1875 by Furness, seen here in a fairly decrepit state. You can see the tops lopped off the chimneys where the structure had deteriorated on the right, and that has not been fixed since. By 1963, when the school first began formal discussions with Khan, it had already determined the general course of action for its expansion, to tear down all but the original Haviland building and build a new campus behind it. But everything changed when Khan was hired. A press release, which Khan himself read and approved, noted that although the school intended to preserve only the Haviland building, Khan has expressed a desire, it reads, to incorporate a part of the old Furnace building into the new campus. And from then on, Furnace's buildings, seen in Khan's model here, become key to all of Khan's schemes. A 1966 article written for the school newspaper by its liaison to Khan's office, R.H. Reinhardt, further explained the way Khan conceived of the project. In his plans, it reads, Khan began with the college's present buildings, which, while being landmarks of 19th century architecture, are not designed or actually well suited for an art school. Adapting elements of the original building, Khan has created an entire self contained educational community for the Philadelphia College of Art of complementary structures. Khan's designs for the campus went through a number of iterations over his years of involvement with the project. The only constant is the presence of the preserved buildings, the Haviland building and the furnace wings, but not the intermediary expansions. This to me makes clear that the purpose of retaining these buildings was not the retention of everything old, but rather their contemporary relevance or maybe generative power. As Giannopoulos noted, Khan was uninterested in historicity. To wit, Khan's own series of designs for his buildings played with and adapted the elements of furnaces. In some schemes, Khan's buildings adopt the site planning and massing of furnaces. In others, they echo furnaces' mansard roofs. In others, their service towers explicitly relate to furnaces' great ventilation stacks. Even in quick sketches of the Broad Street elevation, where the furnace buildings are obscured by Haviland's neoclassical portico, seen here in the middle right, Khan made sure to include furnaces' stacks poking up behind the pediment. In one particularly remarkable site plan, Khan outlined Furnace's stacks on the left and his own service towers on the right in striking black pencil. Here, it seems clear that the service towers, which had first appeared in the Richards Labs, were explicitly conceived as a contemporary iteration of the industrial ventilation tower. Furnace's stacks were thick and muscular, the legacy of 19th century ideas about the importance of the proper cycling of air for students at the school. Though Khan was most likely unaware of that thinking, he picked up on the importance Furnace had accorded the system. These were no mere chimneys, 
but rather crucial pieces of the building's functioning given powerful expression on its exterior. Khan so valued the furnace ventilation stacks that in all of his office's drawings and models for the project, the stacks, which had been damaged, as we saw, appear restored to their original state. Due to fundraising difficulties, Khan's plans for the new College of Art campus went nowhere. Ultimately, Khan was replaced in 1969 as the school looked to different ways of growing its campus. And remarkably, after Khan left the project, the school resumed planning to demolish the furnace buildings. The only reason it never happened was additional fundraising difficulties in the 1970s. But even though Khan wasn't able to design a riff on the furnace buildings in Philadelphia, their influence can be felt in his work of the period. Here we can see the brick architectural language of the industrial city transform Institute of Management, a major university commission. Whether the homage is intentional is in my view, in a sense, beside the point. Khan had learned from the furnaces building simplicity of purpose and expression and use of sharp contrasts in scale. There is one more episode of Khan's interest in furnace, and it is arguably the most important of all. The Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts was most likely the first furnace building in which Khan spent considerable periods of time. Beginning during his childhood, his drawings were exhibited there on multiple occasions. Beyond this personal aspect, the building itself, as Khan stated very clearly, held tremendous meaning for him. And I argue, formed the basis of his notion of what a museum should be. At the Academy of Fine Arts, Furnace stacked an upper level of museum galleries, dramatically lit from above through skylights, atop a lower level, housing the art school. The structural logic of the building is driven by the creation of properly proportioned galleries, which is imposed on the school below. A great stair hall, entered of course from Broad Street, links these two distinct portions of the building, drawing visitors upward to the light streaming down from above. Upon inspection, both the general parti and a number of details of Khan's two most significant museums, the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth and the Yale Center for British Art, both closely resemble those of the Academy. The Kimball, like the Academy, consists of only two main levels, administrative and educational functions below and structurally articulated galleries above. Once again, the two are linked by a central stair hall. In this case, the case of the Kimball, the stairs carry visitors who enter from the building's back upward to the light above. The famous vault-like galleries provide spatial definition and modulated skylight without the need for interior columns. They recall the way in which furnaces on filotted galleries divide the Academy's museum level into three front to back series of rooms that draw the visitor, visitor effortlessly from one to the next. The structural log logic of the galleries, moreover, almost uncomfortably distorts some of the building's other programs, including the auditorium. The Yale Center for British Art functions in almost exactly the same way with a central stair carrying visitors from the entry on the ground floor to a light-filled triple height central gallery above. Behind the stair sit doors into the lower level auditorium, just as at the Academy. The only difference is that at Khan's building, the functions of introducing the galleries and conveying the visitor upward have been separated. The stairs, as anyone has been to the building will remember, are housed in a tight concrete drum reached after you pass through an open court. Despite this formal difference, the entry sequences of the two buildings provide visitors with similar experiences of being drawn upward toward the light from a compressed space, engendering a sense of arrival upon reaching the skylit galleries. The parallels continue. The structure of Khan's top gallery level, a tight grid of columns supporting V-channel-like beams that house mechanical systems, uh, highlights each gallery as a room in its own right, while allowing for flexible repartitioning which is done through movable wall partitions that George Howe originally designed for Khan for the Yale Art Gallery, just across the street. Of course, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts was not the first Skylit Museum, nor was it the first one in which the logic of the galleries impinges on the building's other programs, but it is unique in its ordering of the various elements of the building and in the clear sense of functional logic it conveys. For Khan, it was the critical museum precedent the museum against which his own were to be judged. And it was as he was designing the Kimball and British Art Center 
that Khan became deeply involved with the academy. Beginning in the early 1970s, Khan in fact visited the academy on numerous occasions, on several of them touring it with academy officials. He spoke and wrote of it poetically with an appreciation for its underlying logic that went far beyond any historians of the time. This was the building that prompted Khan to speak out most emphatically and most clearly about the importance of Furness's work. In fact, Khan played a central and yet totally unrecognized role in saving the building from sale to a private client. His efforts helped tip the scales in a debate over whether the institution should restore its aging landmark or move the museum across town to Independence Mall. Khan's involvement with the restoration effort began in earnest in 1971, when he wrote a remarkable and previously undiscovered letter to the Academy's director relating to proposed renovations of the Furness building, reading in part, I honor this building very much. Would it be out of order in your mind if I assumed the role of architect to help you? Soon after, Khan toured the building with senior administrators and made a suggestion that the school restore it to its original condition by the time of the bicentennial in 1976. By this point, the interior and parts of the exterior had been severely modified, with many original details encased in plaster, much of which was done by the same firm that had done Independent Small. So what you see in this photo is what Khan sought to bring back and what ultimately was brought back, but not what existed then and what some academy administrators wanted to sell off. Khan's advocacy to preserve the building culminated in a remarkable act in early 1973. He actually joined the Academy's Board of Trustees and soon afterward, the board's building committee. Not long after, as plans for the restoration faced opposition from certain board members who preferred to move the museum, Khan's help was enlisted. In response, he prepared a formal letter arguing for how and why the building should be preserved. I want to read some highlights of this document. To uncover the concealed structure of the furnace building, Khan writes, is the most important consideration in its restoration and revival of its spirit. In principle, the exposed structure will reveal the original conception of how the building was made to stand and offer its rooms. A great artist never conceals the modus operandi. It is obvious that Furness regarded the expression of the elements of the structure of prime importance and derived from the joy of its excellence the right to allow his wide range of decoration talents free play. Of course, the masonry supported walls are obviously important to stay as originally conceived. The columns of the structure substitute for the walls, imply the walls of its, room, of its rooms, though one can see through them. If walls are needed, they can be beautifully made for circumstantial uses to be evident as non-structural and tentative, stored when not needed. And one thinks again of the panels Khan was working on at the time for the Center for British Art. This is the wonderful opportunity, he writes, to give renewed life to this life-giving and inspired building, true to a work of art which is the giver of a life. When the first strains of the familiar fifth parts the air, it appears like an old friend, only you did not notice before that his eyes are blue. So lasting and able to re-inspire is a good work. I hope that this exchange of new lamps for old retains the genie. It is in the gallery. It is in the school. Kahn's poignant likening of the Academy to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, one of his favorite pieces of music, confirms the role of Furness's building as a touchstone for his own work. Just three days after sending his letter to the Academy, Kahn used almost precisely the same description of great art without mentioning Furness in a public address at the dedication of his Fort Wayne Fine Arts Center in Indiana, seen here. Interestingly, the Fort Wayne building's main elevation borrows from that of the Academy both in its attention-grabbing tripartite composition and in the central column that bisects a segmental arch and divides the symmetrical entrance into two halves. As at the Academy, the dramatic front of Khan's building becomes a kind of billboard that dramatizes an otherwise program-driven composition of brick volumes and punched windows. These parallels, along with Khan's carefully chosen and deeply affectionate language, demonstrate that Khan conceived of the integrated structure and organization of Furness's building as remaining valid and indeed as very similar to his own work. But the importance and singularity of Khan's understanding of Furness emerges most clearly through comparison to the comments of other architects and scholars of the time. 
apart from Khan, the rest of the architecture world in the early 1970s saw Furness as a heroic individualist and talented ornamentalist, a marked improvement from earlier dismissals, but still missing the larger pur purpose and social meaning of the work as Khan saw it. Scully, for example, in his American Architecture and Urbanism of 1969, praised Furness's vivacity, but dismissed his work as having, quote, optical rather than programmatic impetus, and described various of his buildings as a paroxysm, demented, like some exotic gate, and active and dangerous. Robert Venturi, writing in Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture in 1966, praised Furness's mannerist distortions and strange recombinations of conventional forms. The historian uh, James O'Gorman, in his landmark study, The Architecture of Frank Furness in 1973, which accompanied the Philadelphia Museum of Art exhibition, described Furness's work in similar terms and suggested, following Venturi, Furness as a precedent for the architecture of the contemporary picturesque. He celebrated the influence of Furness's ornamental style, as he put it, on Lewis Sullivan, but dismissed that Sullivan's functionalist ideas and the subsequent modern movement could be traced to Furness. Back in Philadelphia, thanks in no small part to Kahn's efforts, the Academy Board finally decided in January 1974 to reject one final attempt to move the collection. Kahn attended the meeting to participate in the vote, and he spoke poetically about the need to save the building. The result was unanimous, and the threat to Furness's academy seemed finally to have been put to rest. That meeting was, sadly, the finale for Khan's brief board tenure. His sudden death came less than two months later, and he never had the chance to see the building return to Furness's vision. As Khan had suggested, the post-restoration reopening was time to coincide with the bicentennial celebrations two years later. But in the flurry of activity around the restoration, Khan's early involvement seems to have been quickly forgotten. Academy officials focused on the institution's future, while historians interpreted Khan through a European lens that left little room for Furness. Not even Khan's biographers mention his service as an Academy trustee. It is as if the entire episode never happened. A clue to this process of forgetting appeared in 1979 in the form of a catalog for an exhibit of Khan's travel drawings held at the Academy. The beginning of the catalog confirms Khan's involvement in the restoration and his broader admiration of Furness. Academy head Richard Boyle, in his foreword, recalled his first meeting with Khan. Together, he wrote, we walked through Frank Furness's great building and talked of its impending restoration. Khan, then a member of the Academy's Board of Trustees, emphasized in particular the creation of spaces and of the daylight that filled them. Indeed, in his lexicon of architecture as a treasury of spaces, he considered the academy building to be one of the gems. He also talked of the structure of the building, the order of it, and the practical way it performed its twin functions of museum and school. The exhibition curator, Frank Goodyear, discussed Kahn in similar terms in a brief acknowledgement section. I only met Louis Kahn once he writes, at a trustees meeting of the Pennsylvania Academy in 1973, when the future of the great building was undecided. Khan spoke at that meeting on the building's behalf, defending its functionalism, its excesses, even its seeming peculiarities as he would a favorite child. It seems likely to me that the meeting Goodyear recalled was held at the beginning of 1974, rather than in 1973. But apart from this minor detail, both men's recollections confirmed that Academy leaders remembered Khan's involvement accurately and with deep appreciation. The evocation of order and functionalism in particular recalls how Khan discussed his own work and furnaces. But it is the next section of the catalog that hints at how this story failed to make it beyond the Academy of Fine Arts. A formal introduction framing the historical importance of Khan's travel drawings contributed by none other than Vincent Scully. Scully's involvement in the exhibition suggests that he may have known of Kahn's role in the Academy restoration, for at a minimum, he likely would have seen Boyle's and Goodyear's contributions to the catalog. Yet Scully did not mention Kahn's affection for the building in his introduction here, nor in any of his subsequent lectures and writings, leaving his earlier claim that Kahn was never attracted to Furness's work as his final public pronouncement on the subject. Whether deliberate or not, this quiet omission 
had the effect of burying the Khan furnace connection and steering subsequent Khan scholars toward the influence Scully preferred to discuss, Khan's travels through Europe. Indeed, the argument for the importance of Khan's European travels first emerged in its fully fledged form in this very introduction to the Academy exhibition. Deftly moving through the travel drawings Khan completed in Europe in 1950 and 1951, Scully identified the source of Khan's subsequent architecture, where the first monumental architects of the Mediterranean world broke through to him, he writes, and where Khan found, quote, architecture of a more timeless kind. Scully's essay provided the speculative roots of much of what is now taken for granted about Khan, that he belonged to a European lineage of architecture and that his primary influences were classical and perhaps medieval. Yet just pages away is the forgotten evidence of an alternative narrative, one that posits Khan as an inheritor of a regional architectural culture uh, rooted in the city of Philadelphia. It would take another decade for a historian to notice what Khan had about Furness's methods serving as a precedent for a distinctly American form of functionalism. In 1991, in his essay, Frank Furness, The Flowering of an American Architecture, published in the volume seen here, George Thomas wrote of Furness not as an eccentric Victorian, but as the creator of a new method of making form represent purpose, in turn opening up the possibility of functional expressionism as an alternative to Beaux-Arts formalism. Based upon his studies of Furness's career, Thomas argued that Furness, quote, believed he was doing no more and no less than developing a modern American architecture out of the elemental forces of American experience. Kahn saw Furness in exactly the same terms. His emphasis on Furness's expression of structure prefigured the general notion of his reality-based system of design. In Furness, Kahn found a precedent for a modern architecture that rejected aesthetic prescriptivism and instead derived form from the exuberant expression of a building structure and purpose. As Kahn sought to derive architectural expression from the meaning of a building to make it what he wants to be, as he liked to say, he had few precursors to follow in the worlds of the international style or the Beaux-Arts. But he did have Furness, who more than a half century earlier had promulgated his own ideals for what a museum, a school, a bank, a library, and a railway station, among others, should be. That Kahn himself recognized his and Furness's commonality of purpose demonstrates that the kahn furnace connection is not the invention of a theorist. It is rather a marker of an architectural conversation across time between two architects seeking to invent a new way of making forms for a world unmoored from tradition. Thank you very much for coming. And this is the citation of the paper, which includes all of the uh, archival sources for this alternative narrative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Izzy, that was wonderful. Um, I think for this section, if you could stop sharing your screen for a moment, um, and then we could bring it back up if anyone has any specific questions. Um, so just a reminder, if anyone has any questions um, or, or comments that they'd like to make, please feel free to drop that in the chat box. Um, oh, Jim Garrison asked, uh, what was the relationship of the 1973 PMA exhibit to the PAFA restoration? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, I actually, George Thomas would be able to speak to that better than me because um, he was involved in both of those projects, um, but they were it was it was a moment when Furness was being reappraised and seen as important in a way that he wasn't before. Although, as I said, it was mostly in so this context of being seen as like um, a kind of uh, a little bit like Frank Lloyd Wright, like a, a architectural contrarian who was individual and anti-conformism, and I think that was appealing at that at that moment. Um, and so there's a reappraisal, and then there are people who are involved in both, but. I don't know if the to what degree the they were like coordinated with each other rather than just happening at the same time. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, Jim wanted to clarify. He said Jim O'Gorman. Question mark. Well, so Jim O'Gorman was the 
really the curator and he wrote the catalog for the um for the philadelphia museum of art exhibition and that's called the architecture of frank Furness. and it, it i don't know if people have seen it but it has amazing servin robinson photographs of the furnace buildings that were commissioned for the show um i don't as i i'm not aware of jim o'gorman being involved in the academy of fine arts restoration i thought of that as a high myers project but someone could correct me because i i don't know Great. Uh, Sandra asks, uh, do you think Khan would have done anything different than, oh, sorry, my, just, just gift. Do you think Khan would have done anything different than Vitetta Myers did for the 1976 restoration of Pafa? Um, no, I think it's, it is interesting looking at that letter and then, in, and then thinking about how the restoration was handled. Um, I think it it's more or less exactly the kind of approach to the building that that Khan was calling for. I think where there maybe is the difference is that um, Khan was in no way a preservationist. He was not especially interested in in treating existing buildings as objects that couldn't be touched. So I think had Khan actually uh, served as their architect as he as he had offered to do, I think he may have proposed some bolder interventions, but it would have been conceived as a way of continuing the underlying themes of the furnace building. But um, I, I wonder what Khan would have done if he had been uh, actually hired and allowed to carry out a project on a furnace building. One other interesting thing um, in that project was that was when the, the, the iron truss on the Cherry Street facade was exposed. So you know, that building was quite close to the uh, Khan's AFL-CIO Medical Center, which has the Varendil trusses in the staircase, but Khan wouldn't have seen the Academy truss because it was it was covered over at that time, which is why I think it's more likely he was looking at the B&O terminal. Um, but I think he would have very much appreciated that that truss was, was uncovered. Okay, um, so Frank, don't worry, I see your question. I'm just gonna jump around a little bit. Um, but Joshua asks, doesn't O'Gorman attempt to connect Furness with Sullivan and the legacy of American architecture in his three American architects? Um, that's not something I've looked at in quite a long time, so I could get this wrong. Um, but but yes, I, I, I think he does. I would agree with that. That's my memory of it. Okay. Frank uh, asked, what commentary from Khan exists regarding the fine arts library at Penn designed by Furness, where Khan taught his famous master's architecture studio? So I've spent some time um, looking into that. And there's what we know is that Khan insisted on teaching his studio. Uh, there's the sort of rumor that gets circulated that Khan refused to go into uh, Meyerson Hall because he didn't get to design it. Um, he, there are pictures of him in it. We know he did go into it, but he didn't want to teach in it. Um, I, there's anecdotal stories. I mean, there's an anecdotal story about someone, um, walking up the stair with Khan and him pointing at the furnace windows and how wonderful they were. But I haven't found any, like, really clear, uh, speech or writing of Khan's about that building, which is interesting because it was obviously a building that mattered to him when he was a student. And then again, when he was teaching, again, though, similar to the Academy of Fine Arts, the, the version of the Fine Arts Library, what is now the Fine Arts Library, that um, Khan was teaching in was really disfigured. It was very far from, from how Furness intended it, and especially the reading room being cut in half completely sort of took away the the sense of light and and weight and structure that was essential to the expression. So it was not until right, but I don't remember the year nineteen ninety, early nineteen nineties, that that was restored and by Nick Giannopoulos. But that might have colored what Khan would have had to say about it. I would say when he was alive. Okay. Uh, any anyone else have any burning questions they'd like to ask Izzy? I have one actually. I mean to jump ahead in line if anyone has one. Um, but so 
I grew up um, in Northeast Philly, uh, in the Buffleton area, and uh, there was a development of houses called the Green, um, what was it called? The uh, Green Belt Knoll, which is allegedly the first racially integrated um, building development in Philadelphia. Um, but I've never really been able to figure out to what extent Khan was involved in the design of the houses there. Because the historical marker says that he was involved, but I haven't really ever been able to find out too much about the extent to which he was around. So I don't know if you, I, you know, I don't expect you to know everything about Khan, what he built off the top of your head, but if if you know anything about where to look to learn about that stuff, let me know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just to some degree, I, I have to plead ignorance about that. I mean, I, I can't answer like specifically Khan's involvement. I can give a few general thoughts. I mean, I think that that, that early period of Khan's career where he's doing social, really wants to do social housing and is very taken with the sort of utopian ambitions of, of modern architecture is quite interesting and still has not been written about nearly as much as all the stuff about how wonderful the monuments and museums of the 1960s and 1970s are. But there is stuff about it in about his political commitment and interest in housing and Sarah Williams Goldhagen's book. And there is also a, a what I think is a very nice essay by David Brownlee in the 1991 book, Khan in the Realm of Architecture, that talks about some of those earlier projects. Um, and then there are presumably, well, the Khan archives kind of are not, are very, very spotty pre-1950. So I don't know if you would find a lot there. Um, but one other thing about it is that at that moment, sort of individual authorship was less important to these architects who were working in different sort of collaborative groups, cons like with Stonerov for a while, and then he does projects with people he isn't explicitly partnered with. Um, and that's also part of the story of that kind of utopianism in modern architecture where the, um, it, it's, a, it's a little like anti-hero worship moment, even though the hero worship comes back after, but the, the social ambitions kind of took center stage at that at that time. Alex, can I drop jump in? Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay. So those uh the Greenbelt Bowl and then the Concord Park, which is up in the Chamonix, were part of um a developer named Morris Milgram. And we have his papers at HSP and they're extensive. So we actually have drawings and floor plans of Greenbelt Knoll, uh, which are incredible to look at. They're really cool. Uh, Louis Kahn's name is, it, it, he is in there, but his involvement, I'm not sure what his involvement is. If you want to know more, again, Morris Milgram is the name of the developer and the name of the papers that are at HSP. It's a very cool but, story. And it was intentionally, but, it was at the time of, um, you know, uh, uh, all the other suburban developments that were explicitly exclusive and segregated and did not allow um, Black ownership. They were Concord Park was intentionally um, interracial. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that uh, you guys had this paper. So they're I'm incredible. Yeah, there's like a letter. We have it on view right now. There's a letter from Polly Murray to Morris Milgram. There's a letter from Eleanor Roosevelt to Morris Milgram. So he was, a, you know, he was an active um, developer in, as you're saying, is he in utopian ideas. Well, that's uh, very good to know because, like I said, I grew up down the street from that development, so I've always been curious about it. Uh, we have another question from Mark uh, for Izzy. Um, Mark says, you mentioned Neescott Brown's connection with Khan. Did he have any relationship with Robert Venturi? I mean, Khan and Robert Venturi had a very close and then um, later acrimonious relationship. Um, but yeah, starting from um, Robert Venturi's, I want to say it was his thesis at Princeton. I would have to check that. But I think Khan came as a critic to Princeton at Bob's request. Bob worked for you know, Saarinen and Khan. They were on the faculty together at Penn. Uh, there was a point at which there was a falling out. Um, 
Bob at various times suggested that Khan actually took some of his ideas and felt like felt like there was an idea that he had taken Khan's ideas, but Khan was actually borrowing from him. Um, so it gets a little bit messy with big egos, but yes, there is a very close relationship between the two of them. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of shared, shared thinking, um, even though they kind of go in different directions. Thank you. And uh, just to call attention to it, Justina also dropped the link to the Morris Milgram papers in the chat. Um, anyone else? Last call? <laughs> okay. Well, Izzy, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, and, and thank you for sharing your research with us. Uh, and before we wrap things up, I do just want to put another quick Carpenters Company plug in. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation, which I am sure you did, we have another presentation coming up on April 13th. I'm going to drop the link right now. Um, that will be with Dr. John Bryan about Robert Mills. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with Robert Mills, uh, he is actually the architect for the Washington Monument um, and also the original U.S. Patent Building, um, which is now part of the Smithsonian Buildings. Um, but Dr. Bryan will be talking about Mills' relationship with Benjamin Latrobe um, and um, relevant to the Carpenters Company, how that inspired his work with fireproof buildings. So it will be a timely one for us. Um, so thank you again, Izzy. Uh, thank you, Justina, and to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and um, of course, to Premier Building. And thank you all for attending. We, we appreciate it. And uh, everyone have a wonderful night.